All right, let's get cracking, shall we? If anyone turns up late, we can take their badge away, take away their production badge. This is an open session, so we're all friends here. And uh, we're going to talk about how to create an authentic video game. Uh, that's me. I look very grumpy in that photo. I was very hungry. I'm sorry. And that's the studio that I'm from, Warwick Digital. I have the great pleasure of working with some very fine people there. Um, there are some other Auric Digital production talks that go on, one from Hannah, one from Tess. I strongly recommend you go and seek them out. Not now. We'll see. Um, and this slide here is basically the thing that you should kind of keep in mind. So basically, I'm going to make the argument that if you want authenticity in your games, it comes from good product ownership. Okay, That is the argument that I'm going to make. The other thing that you need to know is that at Auroc, uh, we split the pr uh, product owner role 50-50 between the design lead and the production lead. Now, I can see some people going, but that's not Scrum. And it's not. But believe me, it works. I won't go into why it works, but it does work. But you need to know that because basically the production team and the design lead take that role uh, between the two of them. So what we're going to cover? Well. We're going to talk about our games in context, so you know what kind of stuff we've made. Um, talk a little bit about those. We're going to talk about what is authenticity, because you know it's useful. Uh, does anyone care about it? Is a very good question to ask. How do we prove its value? We're in production. We want to know how we actually prove value, uh, rather than just have opinions on value. And how do we actually get authenticity? Okay, so it matters. We think it's valuable. We can prove its value. How do we do it? So, Mars Horizon. Uh, it is a space agency management game. We put it out in 2020. Uh, published it with um, the Irregular Corporation, who are now part of Epic, I think. Um, and uh, it's about going to Mars, writing or rewriting history. You don't play the astronaut. You play the space agency. We partnered with the European Space Agency on it. We're currently working on a sequel because it did great. Um, it was a good game, a uh, sort of uh, strategy management game. Brewmaster 2022. Uh, this is a cozy homebrewing simulation game. So think things like a PC building simulator and things like, I don't know, car mechanic simulator, those sorts of things, except you're making homebrewed beer. Um, how, what do you do? Well, you become a brewmaster, so you understand, you start to understand the real world chemistry of brewing, which is, by the way, very, very complex. Um, and you use lots of different ingredients to create lots of different styles and types and qualities of beers. And it's a great. And then there's this one, which probably, hopefully, a lot of you have seen. Uh, this is Warhammer 40,000 Bolt Gun. Uh, it, is a retro first-person shooter. So think, so you remember how Doom used to play? It, it feels like how you remember Doom used to play, right? Um, it is, you, these are the things that you do in this, uh, and if you're a Warhammer nerd like I am, uh, then uh, you'll be very familiar with those. Um, you run around, you're in corridors quite often, uh, and you shoot things, uh, you shoot demons. It's great fun. And uh, it did great. Japan. So what is authenticity? Um, well, let's, let's start with some definitions, because every good talk has got to go to Merriam-Webster and find out exactly what the, defini uh, the definition is. So I've nicked these from a bunch of different places on the internet. The quality of being real or true. Hmm, interesting. True to a personality, spirit, or character. I really, really like this one. I think that one's really good. Conforming to an original so as to reproduce essential features. I quite like the latter half of that one. I really don't like the former bit of that. That feels like you're copying somebody else's homework. So I can tell you what it's not. It's not accuracy, right? Authenticity is not accuracy. Um, it's not realism. It's not detail. Okay, so it might be accurate. Your game might be accurate. But it could be massively inauthentic. So, for example, if you're old enough uh, to remember the PS2, 
Um, you might remember that the tie-in games with movies were very bad around those times. They didn't feel like you were playing as, I don't know, a, a B from the B movie. Um, but it looked like the B from the B movie, right? Um, so it was accurate, but it didn't feel like you were playing as uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Um, uh, but you can also think of other games, right? So modern military shooters that will go unnamed, they don't feel like being in a, in a battlefield, right? They don't actually make you feel like you're taking the call of duty, right? They are, like, they might have the trappings of all of those things, they might have licensed all the guns, but they don't actually feel like being shot at. Um, see also things like virtual tabletops, doesn't feel like playing D&D &D in the same space, right? Like, these sorts of things. Um, and I just wanna say, like, no shade is intended. Like, obviously I'm not making the argument that, oh, well, if you don't have authenticity, then you won't do a good game. Because those games that I've sort of um, thrown under the bus a little bit, um, those are obviously very popular, really great games, we love them. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they are not authentic. Uh, they are not, uh, yeah, so there's definitely no shade there. Also, by the way, you can be inaccurate, but authentic, right? So think about things like sports games. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, you might look at something like FIFA, okay? Um, um, they are not, they are not, in or, they are not, um, uh, they are, they are kind of convincing, but they aren't necessarily accurate, okay? So, if you are um, playing as a, your favorite footballer, like Eric Cantona, um, or... Uh, <clears throat> Peter Schmeichel or whoever, um, then um, when you're playing as them on the pitch, it really doesn't feel like you're running around kicking the ball and doing all that sort of stuff, but it looks like you're watching it on Sky Sports, right? It feels like it's real uh, 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 football. So it's a feeling. Authenticity is a feeling, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'll go home. Um, it's, it's when you're convinced that the subject portrayed feels like the subject, okay? And if you're striving for authenticity, but if that authenticity is missing, then something feels off. Somebody goes, that doesn't feel quite right. You're pretending that it's one thing, but it doesn't feel like that thing. Um, a very fam famous person, very famous judge says, I know it when I see it. If you don't know that quote, don't Google it. Uh, do not Google that. Uh, but basically they were saying that it's one of those things that you can just, you can just, everybody kind of gets what it is, but it's very difficult to actually articulate what that thing is. So does anyone care about it? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really good question to ask, right? Like, because if nobody cared about it, then why would you bother doing it? If you're in production, you don't want to spend money and time and resources on something that, uh, that you don't want to do. Uh, that, that people don't really want. And no, no, not all the time. It's not, it's not important all the time, and certainly not in all things. Um, so for example, if uh, you were working on a big uh, kart racer, let's say, right? Uh, or if you were working on a 2D platformer, for example, you probably don't really consider things like authenticity, because those things don't really have either a real world analogy or they're kind of already fantastical. And so the authenticity isn't really required. There's no feeling of that, oh, this is, this is an authentic Super Mario clone. Like it's not a thing that kind of goes into that. And, and also like there is value in variety, right? All I play is authentic video games is just not something that anybody's ever going to say because there is uh, there are lots of different kinds of players and they want different things from the games that they uh, that they purchase. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it is important, uh, which is lucky because I've done a whole talk on it. Um, and basically, it can be really, really important. Um, and. That authenticity is something that comes in a lot of different ways, right? So whether it's that football analogy of everything looks exactly like it would be on television, or whether or not, it, or if it's something like um, something like uh, with Brewmaster, for example, where it really does feel like you are actually putting the chemicals together in a, in the correct way to make the style of beer that you actually want. Um, 
there's lots of different types of that authenticity. And feelings can be very difficult to, to quantify. So when we talk about like things being a feeling, that's really hard to kind of get across succinctly what that is. And customers find it really difficult to do that. And you might think that's a bit of a cop-out, but also think about things like fun, right? How do you define fun? It's just a feeling that gets there. People have written thousands of pages, thousands and thousands of tedious pages about a lot of the things uh, to do with feelings around video games, but they can be really, really hard to quantify. Um, and if customers can't, pinpoint the value of it. It's very difficult for us to do it as well. But we do have some data to actually back up these claims. All right, we'll do it then. So we really, really love data uh, at Auroc. Um, we like to say that it guides our decision-making process. It never tells us exactly what to do because we're in a creative art form. We're, in, we're making art but we're making commercial art, so we can take, we can run experiments, we can ask people stuff. And indeed, that's what we, that's what we did. We, we quite literally asked them, do you like authentic games? Um, so we do things like surveys, uh, just for a bit of context. Aurox audience is, um, 25 to 34 is the biggest audience, but not far behind are 18 to 24 and 35 to 44. They're like literally almost the exact same percentage of our audience. So really you can say our audience is 18 to 44. Take that, personas. Um, so, um, so it's a really big audience. Um, and it's a global audience. Uh, we have people who are obviously from your, your sort of typical countries and that sort of thing that you usually think of. But we also have lots of players in lots of different parts of the world that really love our games too. Uh, there's a particular player in uh, Vietnam who played the Brewmaster demo for, I think, something like 60 hours, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, we actually just asked, we just straight up asked, is, is authenticity actually important to you? And they said, yeah, yeah, it is. And so is this. Um, so yeah. Um, now, obviously, this is, a, this is Brewmaster, so I gave you that intro as to what Brewmaster is, and we were really specific as to what, um, you know, it, that's a really specific kind of a game, right? Uh, but we can see there that players really do value this sort of stuff. This is kind of quantitative data telling us exactly this. Um, and we use those same surveys to actually lean into authenticity as well. So Brewmaster did pretty well. Uh, certainly uh, reviewed very well, um, certainly on Steam and with uh, crit critical reviews. Um, and we know that when we look at this survey data, we can actually then go and say, well, what kinds of authenticity are these people actually looking for? So we said, uh, listen, how important is a detailed, realistic simulation of brewing chemistry to you in this game about brewing beer? And very, very much so, very, very much so. Um, so Five out of five, yes, absolutely, really, really important, really, really need it, it's crucial. But you'll notice that even though that's number five is the biggest one, three and four are also the two, then, then come second and third, right? So yeah, this is, so we wanted to lean into for our authenticity about what this game would be. We wanted to lean into a detailed, realistic simulation of brewing chemistry, and that made us make some very difficult decisions, like, for example, simulating real world chemistry in a video game, right? That is really quite tricky. Uh, but we had to do it and we knew we had to do it because we knew our players wanted it. But we also used the data to lean into inaccuracy for authenticity. And uh, now if you're a beer fan or a, a bit of a foodie or one of these sorts of things, um, this might not surprise you. But basically we said, well, we have this thing called the tasting process, and basically you find out what kind of a beer you've made, what style it is, what color it looks like, what it tastes like. And we said, well, how, how important is it then that, that we have like a detailed version of this as well? And we thought we'd end up with like fives, and we got some fives. But actually, it ended up somewhere in the middle. Like, eh, eh, it's fine. And we really got thinking about this because our immediate assumption was that people would want to know exactly everything about the beer that they just created and that they were now tasting. But when you then dig into the dig into the um, into beer, it turns out that basically even beer experts don't really agree on what a pale ale and uh, a sort of 
New England IPA, where the difference, where the actual difference lies, right? So that's a, there's actually some there's some there's some gray areas, and that is what this is telling us. There are actually gray areas in the real world tasting process, and you should try to get those across in your game. So for example, so this resulted in our game. Um, having five different styles that the engine says, we think you brewed one of these. Which one was it? And now we'll tell you how accurate you are. Um, we asked Mars Horizon players. Um, we worked the, with the European Space Agency on the original Mars Horizon. Did you like it? 92%, yep. Yeah. 4.9, I didn't know. Whoops. Uh, but very few people said I don't care. Um, and again, brands, partners, it, all of this stuff is all about authenticity. Let's go back to that football example. There's a reason that you are cool with advertising in your football game, but not cool with advertising in your action adventure, right? And it's because of authenticity. It's because you go, yeah, I mean, obviously there are adverts on the sidelines, but I don't want to see Nathan Drake opening a Kool-Aid or whatever. And data help, helps us actually broaden into different markets too. I'm not going to read all of these out. Um, <laughs> thank God. Um, but we asked Mars Horizon beta testers, um, what did you actually think about the game? What did, what did you do? And we, we basically just gave them a space to talk about and talk about their feelings about what it was. All of these quotes, <clears throat> we thought we'd end up with a bunch of management strategy simulation e fans. Um, as a science teacher playing your game about launching stuff into space, um, one of these, I cannot remember which one it is, one of these is from somebody who works in mission control at European Space Agency. I thought that was amazing. But you can see that what we're doing here is we're winding our audience. We're not just approaching gamers, because that term is just gone. Like, it's just, it's just nonsense now. We're now trying to approach lots of different people. And I can tell you, the biggest audience of, peop uh, of gamers are people who don't play games, by far and away. Right? So if you can convince somebody to part with their money and they don't call, refer to themselves as a gamer, you're on, you're on something good. And you get that with authenticity. Because you have to be interested in games to be a, a gamer, but you have to be interested in beer or space or killing demons to be interested in you know, those other things. And we won a, uh, an award for it. Uh, James Paul G, Learning Game Award. Uh, we got Best Informal Learning, People's Choice. It's basically about how do we t use um, games to, to teach things, real things. Brewmaster just got nominated for one. Fingers crossed. And also, authenticity is an engagement driver. So again, Auroc likes to really um, partner up with the marketing team. We're really, really close production, marketing, development. We're all really tight knit. Um, and you can go and look at all of these these cool things that people were talking about in our game. This is f this is free advertising, right? Like this is free advertising for Bolt Gun. This is what we want because we only have a limited amount of budget, right? We're a small studio, we're 130 odd people, teams of 20, 30 people, right? These are relatively small things, and these are people talking about authenticity. Bolt Gun is in the Space Marine universe, which we hid, but we it was in there, right? Um, I made this cool model from the main character. We didn't pay somebody to do that. This is Dave Oshry, who uh, is kind of an influencer in the uh, retro shooter space, runs New Blood, if you know that place. And he very much enjoyed it. Um, and you know, again, they're putting that in front of different people. Lots of the replies were, I didn't even know about this. And again, it's because that authenticity is there. We took the time to understand the genre um, and um, it meant that like, it served those people. Um, authenticity discussions often go around aesthetics, world building, nostalgia, passion for a genre. And then it also drives opportunities. Okay. So influencers and brands are really, really useful to put into a product, but only when they're authentic, right? So like, for example, and I'm a huge fan of this, uh, for example, Vin Diesel's Wheelman, right? Classic video game, amazing. Check it out if you haven't. Um, that feels authentic. It's like a, 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 it's like a big explosive dumb action movie. And of course, who are you going to get to go into that? You, you're going to put v, Vin Diesel in there. See also, Fifty Cent and Stranglehold and all that good stuff. Um, 
But these folks, they want to get involved in things that feel authentic to their brand because otherwise it feels really hollow. And the thing they are bringing with them is their audience. And so if they, every time they do one of these things, they are kind of spending some of that cred credibility. So the more authentic that you can make your thing, the more likelihood it, there is that they'll get involved. So Bolt Gun had Rahul, right? Rahul, we didn't, <laughs> so Rahul saw the game and said, that looks amazing. And then like our marketing community team reached out and said, do you want to be in it? And Rahul was like, yeah. And that's how that, that came about. This man has gone to space and played our game on Xbox's, uh, Xbox On, I think it is, uh, Xbox's big Twitch stream channel, right? And the only reason Tim got involved is because Mars Horizon was authentic. We were working with the European Space Agency. The only reason we are working with the European Space Agency because, again, we know the thing. We, we're, we're being true to the game. Uh, we're being true to the subject, I should say. And that's Garrett. Garrett is an incredible pioneering brewmaster. Uh, again, absolutely amazing. And all these other brands. We made our own beer. Uh, we work with all these different beer brands. And these are opportunities that we as a smaller team got. This isn't 500 people in Montreal. This is, you know, 25 people in Bristol. Um, but these opportunities come along because these people love this stuff. And the best of these opportunities actually reinforce this, uh, this, this authenticity itself. We talked about the, the FIFA um, advertising, for example. It feels authentic, but you, you, you know, they're definitely making money on those things. Spoilers. Um, so, yeah, all of these things, once again, reinforce the product. When you have a person who has 30, 40 years of brewing experience saying to gamers, this actually feels like brewing, that's really powerful. So how do we do it? It's this. It's research and immersion. And it's also the really blurry areas in between. So the first kind of uh, thing that we're going to talk about is research. This is basically, uh, or it's all in the head essentially, right? This is about learning. This is about facts and figures. It's about all of the stuff that you can learn from a book. Um, it's gathering up information about the subject so you, that you know what it is that you're talking about. It's all in the head, like I say. This is the Spacepedia. We actually wrote a massive encyclopedia about space and then just chucked it into Mars Horizon. And it was really, really popular. So we did the same on Brewmaster uh, because we knew all of that stuff. So we, we want to study the thing. We might want to ask questions like, so what's the important media around space, right? The important books, lecture series, the people around space. Knowing Carl Sagan, how does Carl Sagan talk about space? How does that northern guy who's like millions and millions of worlds, how does he talk about space, right? How do they think about space? How do people actually talk about it? Do they get excited? Because you could very easily think, oh, it's just all science. It's like scientists sort of looking at spreadsheets and numbers and stuff. But it, they're some of the funniest people in the, like, in the world, right? What are their memes? What are their in-jokes? What do you need to know to be one of them? What qualifications have they got? Should you get one? That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Should you get a qualification to make a video game? What are the misconceptions? There's a really classic example in Star Wars. Again, it's a lecture in video games, so it's got to have a Star Wars reference. Um, there's a bit where one of the characters, I don't know, Yoda or something, says something about making a parsec run in a certain amount. You basically talk about parsecs as a unit of time. A parsec is a unit of measurement. It's actually uh, of distance, basically. So they get it wrong. If you do that in Star Wars, it's OK, because you're, you're there for the little cute thing that's floating around with Boba Fett. Um, uh, but if you get it wrong in a game that's trying to be authentic, oh, you're in trouble. Do it. Do the thing. Obviously, you can't go to space. Not yet. Well, maybe you can. Um, but you can sure make beer. You can brew beer at home. It's quite expensive. It's about 150 quid to get a bucket and some malt and some water and some other bits and pieces. And it can go really wrong, but at least you've done it. And this is uh, uh, design lead Matt's first brew. It was delicious. It was amazing. I actually made it. So what do the textbooks actually miss about doing the thing? It's all very well and good to actually talk about the theory of doing the thing, but what, how does it feel to actually do that thing? What don't the textbooks get right? Turns out 
that theory and practice do intertwine, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes you leave things out, right? There's good practices I'm sure that everybody does in their own job today that you just go, eh, don't want to do that. Because you know, as a professional, you don't have to do that, right? There's certain things where the theory and the practice don't meet up. And what's it like to make a mistake? If you're making beer, or you're making uh, a, a, a game maybe about um, set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, um, if you make a mistake about the law, or you make a mistake about um, uh, how you would actually make the beer in the first place, for example, if you get that wrong, it's not so bad. If you're punting people up into the atmosphere, and you make a mistake, real bad, right? What's exciting about it? One of, the most one of the most interesting conversations I ever had was with a train spotter. Unbelievable. Trains, trains are cool, folks. Like, they are amazing. It's about the way that people talk to you about it. And if you find the right people to tell you about why your thing is, why the thing is cool, you will love it too. And then what bits are gonna make a good video game? So in Brewmaster, we took out cleaning, because it's real boring. It's super important, like you will potentially make someone very ill if you don't clean out the equipment, but it's really dull. Um, so we took it out. So we lent into other areas harder. And then there's immersion. This man is in the audience today. Um, this is Toby. And um, immersion is basically living and breathing it. So we talked about learning was in the head. Well, this is in the heart, right? This is actually just loving it. This promotes deep understanding. This is the, your, your passion for your subject material. This is being part of the crew, right? It's being that train spotter, telling me why it's so awesome, trying to get people involved in the thing, right? And there is no, there is no amount of book knowledge that will be able to get you to absolutely living it. And that's what we inspire, what we try to inspire in all of our production team members. So here he is in front of a space marine. Research trips. I always like to joke, Lucy, who's in this photo as a producer, she organized this. She organized a piss up in a brewery. <laughs> so, how do real breweries operate? Now, our game wasn't actually about running a brewery, right? It was about brewing stuff at home. But we wanted to know what the difference was. What are the things that actual large-scale brewers have to think about that home brewers don't? What's their day look like? What kind of people are here, right? Turns out, people who brew beer, really fascinating, fascinating folks. Some of the most interesting countercultural people, certainly in Bristol, maybe it's just Bristol, but really fascinating folks. But they're also super big into chemistry, like big chemistry nerds, right? That is just something you will not get unless you go to where it is that they do. In production, we like to talk about go see. Well, this is go see how you make beer, right? Um, what's the atmosphere like? What's it smell like? What are you actually constantly around? Beer smells when you make it. It smells like kind of, it's malty. It's like kind of porridgey, I guess. Um, it's like bread sometimes. What do they think about that we don't even consider, right? What are the things that they have to... Um, get across. So things like commercial um, activities, obviously homebrewing, it's just a, a hobby. We really lent into and away from, we lent away from the commercial side of things in Brewmaster because we didn't want it to be that kind of a game. But they really have to think about this stuff, right? So what are we deliberately leaving out? Money. What do the raw ingredients taste like? It's nothing quite like getting some raw malt and going, oh, wow, that's that some beautiful stuff. And this feels like it could be a jolly, right? Of course, right? Peter, you want budget to go to a brewery. But basically, every single person there learned a heck of a lot about brewing beer. We did a tasting session afterwards. People tried beers. I, I don't like beers. I don't like them. Wrote them all off. Tried them, found out that actually, they're super into gozers. If you know what a gozer is, yeah, they are cool. And adjacent areas. What is really appealing that's about stuff that's adjacent to the thing that you are talking about, right? So we made Bolt Gun. It's not a game about the tabletop game. It's not about the Horus Heresy. It's not about any of those sorts of things. 
But there's stuff around it, right? So when you're wor working with an IP that's massive, people love that stuff, and you've chosen that IP because you love that stuff. So really dig into it to find out what these things are. What the, uh, what the really cool stories that 40K tells. There, there are some amazing stories in there throughout all of that, uh, that IP's lifetime. And uh, what are the details uh, that you only pick up by studying it for huge amounts of time? If you have to look at a plastic model for t 10, 12, 15 hours, whatever it is when you're painting, um, you will notice things about that model that people who just kind of casually pass by it really don't understand. You'll understand the visual design of a space marine much, much better. Um, this is getting into it. This is actually taking it on as a hobby, right? Um, ultimately, how much time have I got? No, that's fine. Um, ultimately, passionate people make people passionate, right? This lot, uh, it is, this is this is Auroch, right? This is the last time that we met, met up in person. And they're all super passionate about something. There's people on here who are super passionate about neurodiversity. There's somebody who's super passionate about um, super high in physics. Uh, someone in here is super passionate about playing competitively in miniatures wargaming thing. Basically, all of these sorts of things. There's loads of different people about who are really, really into lots and lots of very specific stuff, and they're really passionate. When you can tease that out of them and get them interested in the thing that they're actually working on as well, as in the actual IP, you're going to get that authenticity because, again, they're going to get right, right into it. Um, it's infectious. This passion is infectious. And the opposite is also true. If no one cares about the thing that you're making, the people, everybody will see through it. Every player will see through it. If it, and again, you see this with back in the day those PS2 games where people were just like, eh, whatever, put it out. Um, nobody cared about those. Now you see some really interesting IP stuff because those people really do care about that stuff. So we talked about this, didn't we? So if you want strong authenticity, you have to do good product ownership. And the reason is because good product ownership is knowing the product and the audience, which is basically what we've just talked about there, right? We just spent the last half an hour talking about knowing the product, knowing the audience, trying to be one of them. That's this, right? And it leads to that. But you can only do it through this, right? So research and immersion, knowing the product and audience, good product ownership, that will give you authenticity if that's something that you really want. And I strongly recommend that you think about whether or not you do. Because maybe you do, maybe you don't. But ultimately, this is something that the production team uh, can really assist with. It's something that we can really push forward within the team and, and also give the team space to actually do. How many times have you gone onto a project and not, you know, maybe you're doing a porting project or something along those lines and you've not actually played the game before? Like, that's bonkers. How many times have you gone onto a series that's six, six uh, entries deep and you haven't played any of the previous ones? Like, get some time, and we should give our team members space and time to think about these things. But it ain't easy because of all the things that we talked about earlier. It's really difficult to define. There is value in it. You have to go actively look for it to prove that you can get that stuff. And there's always people saying, it's a jolly. Why are people sitting around playing games for five days? They should, like, what do you mean they don't know the product? It's, you, they're just making this thing. There's a really big difference between understanding things on a superficial level and on a deep level. On a deep level, you get the authenticity. On a superficial level, you're kind of just a faking it, right? So it is really difficult. I strongly encourage using data when trying to apply for resources and for convince people that it's actually a thing that's worth doing. Um, and go with a point, go with an objective. Say, this is why we're going to this thing. We're going to the brewery because we want to see, we want to talk to all the people there. We want to see the day from morning till sunset. We want to see all this sort of stuff. We want to take photos. We want to go to that thing, take a photo, nick that texture, put it into our game, see what that looks like, right? Every single discipline can do this. Every single discipline. So it isn't easy, but it is absolutely worth it for all of the things that we talked about too, right? All the opportunities, all of the players that love this thing, all the feedback that we get for our games, the, get the games that we put out most of all, uh, the, the biggest review, 
thing that we always get is you can tell that they care about this, right? Sometimes we've made games that are like, okay, um, but every single time, even if they're okay, the answer is always you can tell that they actually care about the thing is that, that you've made. And that will go a long way. It generates a huge amount of goodwill. Thank you. I'm sweating. Hello. 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 Thank Hi. you very much for the talk. Awesome. Uh, it was it was really good. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, it, it feels like authenticity is linked to nostalgia to an extent, and I think that people's nostalgia of what they remember in terms of the experience that they had at a time uh, can actually be sometimes different to the original, you know, authentic experience, if you like. And I just wondered, like, something like Bolt Gun, say, for instance, where you're trying to, you know, take those elements from Doom and then bring them forward to... Um, how do you find the authenticity if in a situation where you're judging it based on what people remember as being authentic, if you like. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. You, you hit the nail on the head, right? Nostalgia can definitely be a part of authenticity. I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say all authenticity is nostalgia. I don't think you're saying that, but like, yeah, certainly nostalgia can be a big part of that. So how do you get it when you're trying to do something where essentially you're trying to put the rose tinted gr glasses on to get across something, right? If you go and look at, so I'm a big, um, uh, I'm an old man and I like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, so if you go and look at Shredder's Revenge, that's a really great example of a game that plays exactly how you remember Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Arcade working from back in the day. Do not go back and play the 1989 classic uh, TMNT Arcade because it doesn't play like Shredder's Revenge. It's really stilted. It's really, you know, it doesn't look nearly as good, but it's, it's, it's how you remember it. So how do you get to that? I think the way that you do it is you just make the game how you remember it being, right? I think you you I think a lot of people have a shared nostalgia around certain things, right? So um so for example, if you go so if you if you go to like a Sonic the Hedgehog fan, right? They're like, "Ah, oh, thing about Sonic is really fast, really really fast, super fast, super all the time, really fast." Um, if you actually go, play, go back and play the Master System versions or the earlier Mega Drive ones, they're, really, they're not that fast at all, right? But if you're going to make a modern Sonic game, you want to go super fast because it doesn't really matter how it actually was. It's how the sort of agreed, shared, revisionist history of what that was uh, is to, to players. And I think, I think if you ask players, how do you remember it being, they will tell you, right? Goldeneye was the greatest first-person shooter of game of all time. And I will never go and play it again because I don't want that ruined, right? Um, if you're going to do a port of Goldeneye, you probably want to make it how you remember it playing rather than how it actually played. There's a real danger in going back to how it actually played. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Hello, thank you. Um, you used the word fun uh, alongside authenticity. Um, yeah. Uh, as like a, uh, something that is subjective and objective. Like you can't really put your finger on fun. It's very in, difficult yeah. to put your finger on fun. Um, would you say that authenticity is more subjective or objective? Do you think it has a, a point where you can actually go, well, that's more authentic than that because of these reasons? Or do you think there's actually authenticity in people's brains that kind of warp things? Yeah, so I think you know those you know those rank list meme things where you get like a bunch of different pictures of anime and then you rate rate them and Gundam Wing is at the top. Um, yeah, so I think you could do that. You could say this is more authentic and this is less authentic. Definitely. Uh, could you plot that on a graph? Could, I don't know. Maybe not. Um, you could you could do things I think to gesture towards what those things are. Like, is this more? Does this feel more authentic? Does this feel less authentic? But I don't think you could ever get it to a point where you said this is twelve percent authentic, right? I don't think you could ever do that. But I do like the idea that you're coming up with here, which is like, how can we quantify a qualitative feeling, 
And that, I, it, for me, and it's obviously a much wider talk, but for me, that's one of the big jobs of the product owner, uh, or the product owner role, I should say. Uh, it's obviously split at our studio. Um, it's about um, it's about trying to prove a thing that you feel to some degree. Certainly on the production end, it's about that, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think basically the, the first step is to do the, the absolute minimum that you can to try and get some objective value, right? So if you were making a new game, you say, does this feel authentic? You could do an A-B split test, for example, and say, does this feel more or less like how it used to play? Don't let them play the original, but does it feel more or less, right? If you were doing a, you know, a, a tennis game or something like that, um, do these adverts move on the billboard in exactly the way that they that they do on the? I don't watch tennis. Do they have adverts? I'm sure they do. It's just for strawberries. Um, yeah. So you could do that, and I think that is worth doing. But I think that we have to be really careful. And this is why we say we use data that that guides us, but it doesn't tell us what to do, because we still have to, as humans, we still have to make that decision of like, yeah, that feels good. Uh, thanks. It was me. Oh, hello. <laughs> is it working? Uh, yeah, I just it was interesting when you mentioned about the brewery, you have to clean your own equipment. I just think it's, it reminded me of the game Power Wash Simulator. It kind of blows my mind. I'm literally playing that right now. It blows my mind how fun that is because yes. I hate doing that sort of stuff. But Do you own a power washer? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing like Power Wash Simulator, yeah. right? Well, around my house isn't very clean, so <laughs> like I don't use it as much as I should. Sure. But um, yeah, I find that interesting because essentially you took the cleaning out because it's less fun, but that's kind of like less authentic to what it is. So like, I wonder like, is that a really big challenge when you're trying to make something authentic? How do you decide between taking off the authentic features because it's not fun? Yeah, yeah. is that a big challenge? Yeah, good question. Um, so um, how do I decide? Uh, I don't, I look at my design lead and say, how's this? Um, um, but I think, how do, how do they do it? Um, I think basically, uh, again, player testing, user feedback, like it, it, it's all of that same good stuff, right? Like, and how, how you do have to make some pretty difficult decisions, right? You can't do everything all the time. We could have made a beer brewing game that was power simulator as well, right? But then you've got to do loads of mechanics to do all that sort of stuff of like, here's how you get right into the corner of the mash tun. Like, that's not, that's not what the game's about, right? So you do have to, at some point, make some harder decisions. But yeah, I think player feedback, trust the design team to basically know their, their stuff, and that's what they paid for. Cheers. Thank you. By the way, I'm really sorry to the camera person that I keep moving around the space and all that sort of stuff. It's uh, probably like the hardest one today. So Hello, yeah. uh, thank you for the lecture. Thanks. Um, from my understanding, uh, authenticity targets uh, target group that are interested in a specific topic, in a specific genre, and you are creating around that those expectations from that group. Mm -hmm. However, uh, for example, in case of Warhammer Sonic, we can assume how big this group is and how many people will be interested in our title. Yeah. How we do that with more less common topics like brewing? Because I have no idea I'm how so to do it. I'm so glad you asked. Okay, cool. So, super top tip. Um, have you got a Facebook account? Of course you do. You're a human. Um, sign up for the adverts thing. You don't have to spend any money. Um, and try to take out a targeted ad. Okay? So, take a targeted ad and type in uh, uh, this audience must own a console. They are interested in craft beer. Show me how many people you will show my ad to. You can immediately get an audience number because basically Facebook is super deep into everything that you do and understands the things that you do. And you can get a gesture towards how big is this audience, right? Same with um, Bolt Gun. Some of the research that we did is we went onto Facebook, we started an ad, we said people who have liked the Games Workshop page, uh, the Warhammer 40,000 page, uh, and these retro shooters, and it will give you these, it will give you an audience breakdown. Then you can start to really dig into, cool, what if I change the age group of that? Ah, I've changed it too much now that actually I don't get, in, I don't get many people. I, I'm just targeting 70 to 90 year olds, right? 
there's not too many of those people who love that stuff. So you know that that's maybe not the age demographic that you're going for. So then you go back and you, you and there's so many different values that you can tweak and find around those sorts of things. And then go and actually look in the spaces that they're at. We did a survey for a game that we didn't do in the end. Um, and uh, basically we asked Armored Core fans, like, what do you want from like a mech game? And they were like, we just want Armored Core. <laughs> All right. Luckily, they're getting one, so that's good. Um, but go into those spaces, go and be part of them. We're, we're, you know, we were on r slash beer, r slash craft beer, r slash beer porn, uh, r, you know, all, oh god, um, and uh, amazing pictures of beer. Some people get in the wrong end of the stick, but mo mo mostly very good pictures of beer. Um, and you can go and see what those people are thinking about and talking about. And again, that's your first inroad into those things. Go and look on YouTube. What are the influencers talking about? Like, how are they talking about the games, right? There's lots of different ways that you can get into those subjects uh, along the things of, you know, as, 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 as weird as you want to go, right? Woodworking Simulator is a really good upcoming game. Looks amazing. Um, and I'm sure they've done that same research. What are people that love woodworking doing? Yeah. This is going to have to be the last question. Last one. Yeah. I'm going to be around outside. Uh, nervously wondering if this was any good later. So if you want to uh, come and talk to me about it, that'd be great. If you want any other questions. Martin. So it's um, <coughs> sort of clear from the talk that you guys have got a bit of a research process to all of this. Yes. And I'm sort of wondering how much of a sort of supplementary byproduct is authenticity versus it being like a strategic goal? Like where's the boundary? And what I really mean by that is say you get halfway through a project and it's not authentic enough, is it like, well, it's kind of, we tried our best, you know? Yeah. Or is yeah. it like, no, we cancel the project, we redirect the project down these areas? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I, I think basically it really does come down to, do you want your game to be authentic? The reason I was kind of hammering away at this idea of like, you don't have to, but if you think, we really need this to be an authentic video game. So for example, um, we knew we wanted to work with ESA uh, for Miles Horizon 1. Like, we knew we wanted to do that. We had to keep it feeling authentic because they probably would have been like, eh, we don't want to be a part of a game that's, you know, um, I don't know, a, a, a kind of wacky, silly, over-the-top game, right? Like, they wouldn't want to put their brand onto it. And that would have a real effect on the business case, right? Like, we wouldn't have those, we wouldn't have that audience. Um, I think from a purely creative point of view, I think, and this kind of goes beyond authenticity in general, I think you have to kind of stick to your guns. You have to really understand what it is that you're actually going to make. And if you're, if at some point you get halfway through and you've forgotten all of that authenticity, I think something has gone wrong that's the time that we would put the brakes on and say, right, something's not right here. Like, we know we want to try this because these are all the outcomes that we want. Um, but to, 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 like I say, to follow up, it's, it's not always a thing you have to do. You know, we aren't like tick the box. There'll be games that we put out that just aren't authentic at all in, in quite that same way. There'll be big, silly, fun, all that sort of stuff. That's great, we want to do those too. Um, so it really is about what kind of product do you want to make. Sounds good? Awesome.